that's really important for our bone health as the most clear example. It's also important for cardiovascular health, for the brain. It, nothing can really make up for estrogen and progesterone and having a menstrual cycle. <laughs>
happens. And in answer to your question, are there other hormones that we should be thinking about? Yes, because lots of other hormones affect ovulation. So a simple example, if you're not ovulating, if you discover that you're not ovulating, there are several possible reasons, but one possible reason, for example, could be that you have high prolactin, or you have a thyroid problem, or you have insulin resistance. So this is where some of the other hormones come in. And I just want to say it's possible, just so everyone understands, you could be seeing a bleed, even approximately a, a regular bleed every month, but not be ovulating. That's called an anovulatory cycle. That can happen in any situation. That always happens if you're on a progestin-only method of contraception, like the implant or mini pill or something like that. And then also on the pill, on the combined pill, those are drug-induced bleeds. So those obviously are not real menstrual cycles either. And there's no ovulation and there's no estrogen and there's no progesterone with the pill because that's all shut down. That's all shut down. That, that's true. And what would you say, when you say that your period is trying to tell us something, Yeah. what do you mean by that? I mean, our period is our monthly report card. So when everything is going well with health, including eating enough, not having a thyroid problem or you know having treatment for any problem like that, not having too much stress, all the things, when that's happening, then the period should arrive on time and without symptoms and not being too heavy. And so in that way, it's a reflection of health. So if the period is not okay, if it's not regular, if it's difficult in some way, then that is a clue, as I talk about in Period Repair Manual, that's giving some clues about what might be going on. There's going to be an explanation for that. And this is something I use daily with my own patients is to, I ask them about their, even if they haven't come for a problem with their periods, I ask them about their period because then I can be thinking, well, okay, great. If she's ovulating every month, then I know lots of things are going well. And it, it gives me some important information. So when I have male patients, which I occasionally do, I can't ask them that question. And as a clinician, then I feel this actually gap of understanding. It's like, oh, how am I going to, yeah, where am I going to get the clues of what, what might be going on with them? Yes, absolutely. It's like looking at the biofeedback, but obviously women have that extra information that is your menstrual cycle and how is it going on a regular basis. And we also look at when we're thinking about biofeedback and how it's health overall, we could think about mood, energy, sleep, hunger, cravings, the the quality of, of your of your sleep as well, things like that. So I'll ask you something that you mentioned and issues with your menstrual cycle not being present. Yeah. Um, what what could go wrong with your period? So what could be happening if it goes away? So we're, we're looking at the absence of your periods. So what, 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 could be, what could be happening there? Well, there could be several different explanations. So that is why, and I say in the book, that if there's no period, especially for more than three months, then it's important that the doctor have an opportunity to screen for all the different reasons like some less common, a very uncommon reason, but can happen is early menopause, not to scare anyone, but like that's only about one in a hundred. So that, but the doctor can easily rule that out with a blood test called FSH. Then there can be problems with thyroid. There could be high prolactin that I talked about. These are all, there, there's, and there's other ones too. Like there's more less common ones. But once all of those have been ruled out, usually for the majority of women who have lost their period, young women, it's usually one of two things. It's either under eating, which is also called hypothalamic amenorrhea, or it's PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome. So we can talk about those two things. Let me, this, one of my key messages for everybody listening, everybody watching, it is possible to have lost your period due to under eating or under eating carbs and then be mistakenly told you have PCOS based on an ultrasound. That is one of the things I'm really trying to get out there because 
PCOS cannot be diagnosed by ultrasound. It cannot, be, it cannot be ruled out by ultrasound either. So ultrasound, an ultrasound investigation is useful for many different things. So I'm not suggesting not to have that. I'm just saying in the case of PCOS, you don't want to be told you have a hormonal condition based on the ultrasound finding. And I explain why in the book and on my blog as well. I have several blog posts about that. So it's pretty important to know whether the problem is under eating or PCOS because as you know, you know, as a dietitian, obviously one of the treatments for PCOS is to restrict the diet in certain ways. And so if you've already, if the problem is that you haven't been eating enough and then you restrict your diet even further, what happens is you will never, ever, never, never get a period. And I see that with patients, women who come to see me. And so at that point, it requires a 180 degree turn to go in the other direction and eat way more to get a period back. I 100% I agree. And especially when you say people under eating, and that could be a combination of both, but there's also the, the expectation to say over exercising in a, under very chronic stress and under eating, just trying yeah. to be chronically dieting all the time. You can see clients that are going to go below certain body fat level, or there's just absence of adequate energy intake or like very like very minimal amount of carbohydrate intake and you see these clients losing their period for extended yes. period of time so i i am wondering if you could explain is there any risk of looking at someone who loses their period for three years that and this was no other reason but they were over exercising under eating and their period was completely away and then they started eating again and came back is there yes. any risks associated with health on yes. the long term yes well losing your period to under eating is not good for you so we have something in our life called an estrogen score so we need you know through our reproductive decades we need so many years of cycling or pregnancy i mean preg during pregnancy we have a lot of hormones as well so that's obviously an alternative to having cycles but the source of the, the fact that having a cycle ovulating is how we make estrogen and progesterone that's really important for our bone health as the most clear example it's also important for cardiovascular health for the brain so unfortunately having some years of losing the period to under eating will increase the risk later because you just haven't been building up the bone health the way you should have been during those years that's a that's a clear example i mean the truth is i don't want to scare people too because there's lots of women out there who this has happened to and all you can do is go forward you know eat more get your period back and you know try to be as healthy as you can and trust that that you know talk to your doctor about the fact that you did have these years without menstruation and that might therefore increase your risk it usually the bone risk comes later at menopause right so it's with menopause then you're looking, okay, was there a time in your life when you had amenorrhea? Because that has now, on top of menopause, that's increased the risk for bone loss. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would ask you, like, there are sometimes you see patients that they won't tell you until that's very late. Like, they get to see you three years later and they haven't spoken with anyone about their period and they actually felt like that was good. But oh. the problem to be that when they already come to you is it's been a little bit too late uh in the sense that well they've been already three years two years and nothing has been done about it and now there's a point where you ask well have you done anything in the meantime to mitigate it or sort of compensate so it's kind of at least you're doing something to kind of mitigate it or do you think that that wouldn't even be a potential thing that you might have done well, even though you weren't having your period. Okay. Well, first of all, just in terms of raising awareness. So there's a lot of this is an awareness raising campaign happening currently where researchers are trying to get the information out to coaches, out to anyone working with women in an athletic sense, or, you know, certainly even just, you know, more amateur athletes just the message that it's not okay to lose your period, that that is not, that's never, never okay for that to happen to women. So hopefully that will permeate the space and there will be more awareness. In terms of mitigating the risk, okay, so the, the, the primary strategy is to up the calories and the carbohydrate, just 
a lot and commit to that and get the period back. And it can take four to six months to get the period back, even when doing that. That's the best strategy. In, I guess in severe cases, the current evidence-based mitigation strategy is actually to give temporarily give body identical hormone therapy, which is actually like menopausal hormone therapy during the interim, during the months, just until you can reestablish ovulation. So that's probably the main mitigation. I hear what you're saying about strength training. I mean, in theory, yes, I guess that could help to mitigate to some extent. I haven't seen any research about that. Like, I wouldn't want to say it's okay to have, not have a period like because you're strength training that's not the case at all like it, nothing can really make up for estrogen and progesterone and having a menstrual cycle in terms of no, yeah, I, bone health and yeah yeah no 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 i agree completely with you i'm, I'm yeah. just saying so looking back if you're ready if it's like it's been two or three years already there's nothing that you can do to sort of repair those three years but in the meantime that person at least were was doing resistance training was at risk potentially mitigated because now like that if he, it's already in your hands you can do everything about their yeah. diet modify yeah. the risk but do you think that my, my question is if that the, there are three years that are already passed you can't do anything yes. about it right if you, knew, yeah. you had all the evidence do you think that person could have potentially reduced or mitigated the risk if she was doing a lot of resistance training and kind of having a high calcium diet, regardless of like, even if it was a very low calorie, would there be any sort of mitigation risk on okay. doing those things potentially? I hear what you're asking and the short answer is I don't know. I haven't seen any research on that. My instinct is I don't think taking calcium during those years would do anything to mitigate the risk, no. I hear what you're saying though, it's, it's already happened, it's passed. And how can we kind of reassure women? I think all you can do is, like I said, it, if it's past, it's past. You really just have to go forward. And I think the way to mitigate it is actually going forward to understand bones now need attention. And actually one of the best ways to maintain healthy bones, it is, this is partly what you were saying, is to maintain muscle mass. So going forward, yes. I mean, menstruate until menopause and then also do that's where strength training comes in yeah, to optimize bone health. And certainly at menopause, strength training can be very important for reducing bone loss. Why, why do you say low carb or perhaps keto or maybe intermittent fasting, this fat diet could make you lose your period? Because this is very important that people need to understand. Yeah, well, and again, there are researchers looking at this more finally thank goodness like because for many years basically as far as i could tell nobody was thinking about it or caring what was happening to 20 something women i think there's several mechanisms look i'll just say in terms of the low carb thing because it's controversial i'm not anti-low carb i certainly think certainly around the menopause years there can be a strong argument for low carb if for someone who has insulin resistance but we're talking about young women under 30 probably the main problem is under eating. And I think partly what's happening is when you do a, a higher protein diet and low carb diet, that is a potentially an appetite suppressant for some women. So I think there can be some unintentional under eating. Just so I'll acknowledge that. I think also, but from my reading of what little information we have, I think there's also a pretty strong genetic vulnerability, so which kind of makes sense. So if your ancestors, were you know meat and vegetables and not much grain like depending on you know who you descended from i think then perhaps there's something called ovarian set point so your ovulation function will be kind of calibrated to a lower carb diet if your ancestors have been eating grains for 10,000 years which is true for a lot of us i think there's an argument to be made that your kind of ovarian function is calibrated to some starch intake because that's a signal that there's enough food i mean i'd love to see more research into that i guess what i'm trying to say is it does vary woman to woman like certainly you'll have some young women who do go low carb or keto and keep their periods so that's great but that doesn't disprove that some young women go low carb and lose their periods you know i think it's it just basically what i say to my own patients they'll say to me should i 
I'm on a keto diet. Should I stay on that or not? And I'll say, do you still have your period? Are you still ovulating regularly? Because if you are, it's probably okay. That's an example of the period being a monthly report card, right? Like if, if you've still got your period, you're good. If you've lost your period, then no, something is not working. Okay. And yeah. how much truth do you think there is around sleep cycling for hormonal balance? Is that any truth behind it or is it just a myth? I'm just laughing because don't do it. I don't prescribe it. I think, I guess uh, I'm just trying to be diplomatic because I know it's popular out there. Look, I don't, I don't think I'm in a position to totally debunk it. Like I don't have information, you know, concretely that it doesn't work. I guess I would say I don't use it. I don't prescribe it. For what it's worth, nut seeds are beneficial. Like in both books, I talk about the benefits of phytoestrogens. So phytoestrogens in general can help to regulate the cycle. So eating nuts and seeds is in general a healthy thing. I think sometimes actually I do half wonder sometimes if just even the seed cycling is just introducing extra calories into the diet. You know what I mean? Like it's sort of anecdotally people out there, you know, say it helps them restore a natural cycle. I'm not, I'm not against it. I'm certainly not. I guess that's my diplomatic answer. I, I don't support it necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I think. And I don't think there's much research to say that it is very helpful, but I think people are trying to find the magical way to fix all the problems and cycling seat seems to pop out as a solution for it. Let's talk about something I am interested to hear from you and is the introduction or really paying attention to micronutrients, vitamins and minerals with your, for the, your period health. So in your book, you talk about, or you mentioned zinc, magnesium, vitamin D, iodine. Why is specifically this four? They're the ones that I've observed are commonly missing from the diet and can have a big impact on my patients. I mean, this is a lot of the book, both books came from just what has worked for my patients. With the minimal, my strategy, my approach is always the simplest possible treatment that will give a desired outcome. So those four are pretty important. For what it's worth, I'll say zinc and iodine or iodine are deficient on a plant-based diet. I have to kind of, we've, we've now talked about low-carb diet. Now I do need to talk a little bit about an exclusively plant-based diet, which I find very concerning because I, I, and yet I hear, I know that some of your, I know there's people out there who claim they're doing really well and their period's fine on a plant-based diet. So I acknowledge those women, but I will also say I have encountered many, 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 many patients who were not doing well on a exclusively plant-based diet. And that has been my clinical experience. Obviously I only see people who are having problems. So that affects the numbers, but just as a little takeaway for anyone who's been attempting exclusively plant-based and is struggling, look at zinc <laughs> because zinc is one of the missing, it's not entirely missing from plant foods, but it's mostly missing. So look at zinc supplements, look at iodine. Yeah. And there's a couple others, a few others. I would obviously there's B12 this, and iron, which we all know about, but I think it's the zinc and iodine. Someone that is listening to you could come and say, what if I take just a multivitamin and I keep my low calories and the way I keep doing the things, but I just have this insurance policy. I use my multivitamin. What about if that, that's what I do? Would that fix the problem? I mean, usually no. I would say a multi- well, okay, here's the thing. If, if you're menstruating regularly, if your period's fine and you're whatever you're doing and you're on a multi, then obviously that's fine. That's working. If you're on a multi and there's period problems, then you need more. And in the case of zinc, you need more. Like there's only ever going to be like five milligrams of zinc in a multi. I'm talking about a therapeutic dose for zinc of at least 30 that you have to take with food. I just need to inject a couple of, insert a couple of safety comments about it. Do not take zinc on an empty stomach or it'll make you feel sick. You know, don't take more than probably 30 or 40 milligrams per day long, long term without maybe chatting with someone about it, mainly because mainly it can deplete copper, but in the long term, but 30 milligrams is usually safe. And with iodine, 
just be careful. Read my blog post about that. Read my book. Because too, it's true that too much iodine can be harmful. So I just talked to someone earlier, another interview I did, and she's, I'm so careful about iodine that then her takeaway is, oh, don't take iodine because it's too tricky to use. No, that's not the case. I prescribe iodine all the time. Most of my patients, not most, but many of them end up having that. So, and it's quite an important treatment for things like endometriosis and premenstrual syndrome. And it's one of my favorite nutrients for women's health, but you just have to be a little careful. Okay. Would you need to have before even supplementing or thinking to utilize like vitamin D or some of these micronutrients that seem to not be necessarily like water soluble, like vitamin C that you can just have a little bit extra and you just get rid of it naturally. Would you need to have a blood test perhaps to explore some true deficiencies? It, it depends on the nutrient. So a nutrient that you could, you can test is vitamin D. That test is somewhat reliable. You can test zinc, although it's, I don't know that I don't, wouldn't read too much into that. Zinc is one of the water soluble nutrients that we only ever have as much in our body as what we've had that day, basically. Like it, it leaves the body pretty quickly. A nutrient that you cannot test is magnesium. Because a serum magnesium means essentially nothing. Because what matters is what, magne what the amount of magnesium that's inside the cells, inside the mitochondria, which is a part of the cell, and you can't see that on a blood test. And in fact, a magnesium is an electrolyte, so the body will keep magnesium at a steady state to keep the heart working, basically. Like, you know, if you've got, if your magnesium's out of range, there's something kind of serious going on that's not just about deficiency, right? Like, so yeah, so you can't say, I've got a normal magnesium on blood test, therefore I don't need it. That's not the case at all. With magnesium, I basically, unless someone has pre-existing kidney disease, that's the only, really the only exception, or I guess in combination with certain medications, you need to be careful. But in general, most people could just try magnesium and see how they feel. Okay, let's yeah. move to a topic yeah. that I, love and it's PCOS and I think I have quite a lot of patients that really are hungry to have information that is evidence-based that is not like you just go and read this everywhere that they don't really give you information on how to deal better or identify what's going on with the PCOS especially if you're struggling to manage your diet better, there's a lot of myth out there that you should be cutting pretty much everything, lose weight, move more, doing everything that you need to do to reverse or reduce the symptoms of PCOS. So let's get into some of the introductory topics. And the first question would be, what are some of the types of PCOS? Like if we define PCOS first, and then what are some of the types? Because there's not one specific type of PCOS. There are quite a different types of those. Yeah, so I talk about the types in my book. I'm really, by that, I'm talking about the functional types or like the drivers, the underlying drivers of the problem. And the problem is, let's define that, with PCOS, by definition, the problem is excess male hormones or androgens, whether that's visible on blood tests, which it sometimes is, or it's visible in facial hair or significant jawline acne or some degree of hair loss and or any of those things, that has to be present. And the reason I'm saying that is, again, <laughs> that just losing your period and having polycystic ovaries on an ultrasound is not PCOS. Like that could be under eating. You really have to get this right. And so I'd encourage readers to go and look at my book and my blog where there's a flow chart to kind of work through that. But if there's androgen excess and if other causes of androgen excess have been ruled out, like something called adrenal hyperplasia is a genetic condition that can cause an androgen excess. Another cause of androgen excess is certain types of hormonal birth control actually just contain a progestin that's quite testosterone-like. So if all those other reasons have been ruled out and you're left with kind of otherwise unexplained androgen excess, that is, that's PCOS. And usually that's the, you know, that's the, the category it's then put in. That's the diagnosis, the label that's given it. And there's often, but not always difficulty ovulating. And they kind of fit together because, and this relates to a, 
scientific paper that I just wrote, which we can put in the show notes if you want, all about PCOS. I've, I've now got a paper in a peer-reviewed journal about it, talking about the kind of the central role of androgen excess and then the lack of feedback. Because what happens in a normal cycle is when you ovulate, you make estradiol or estradiol, estrogen, and progesterone that feed back and suppress androgens basically. And so that's a normal cycle as we have this from our own hormones, we have a natural androgen suppressing effect. But with PCOS, it becomes a double whammy because first you've got high androgens from multiple drivers, several dri one of several drivers. And then on top of that, you don't have the estrogen and progesterone to feed back and suppress that. So it becomes a vicious cycle of more androgens, less ovulation. And so the way to intervene with that is to both try to suppress androgens and reestablish ovulation, which is why the current approach of using the pill for PCOS is so crazy because it suppresses ovulation. So it's not, it's pushing you arguably farther away from what actually has to happen is to reestablish an ovulatory cycle. That's what my paper is about, which I'll put in the show notes. So. In answer to your types, should I just keep going or do you have a question or? Yeah. Yeah, no, it, like you mentioned that it's like inflammatory, insulin yes. resistant. Okay. There are right. a few types. Yeah, so first acknowledging to some degree some of this, I have to say like to some degree there is a genetic element of course, the genetic or what's called epigenetics. So some women are just born with their androgens dialed up. And I think some of that's actually, to be honest, coming, it's kind of worsening generation by generation. Some of it's coming, I think, from the evidence seems to suggest potentially exposure to environmental toxins in the uterus, like when you were a bit like a fetus, right? Like it's sort of, this is happening to some degree. So I say this only because I really don't want to give the message that like because of these drivers that I'm going to talk about, I don't want to give the message that that's the only cause, that you did something wrong and that's the only cause. But once the situation is established and there's high androgens and PCOS, then the drivers of it or the four types that I talk about in my book is number one, insulin resistance or prediabetes, insulin resistance is, creates more androgens. It's a vicious cycle because high testosterone androgens creates insulin resistance, which creates more androgens. So insulin resistance has to be identified and reversed. Not everyone with PCOS has insulin resistance, which is why it's important to talk about that and test it. Test it by testing insulin, not glucose. That's type one, insulin resistant PCOS. Type two is what I call post-pill PCOS, which is more of a temporary situation of trying to come off Yasmin or Diane or one of the, one of the pills that has a strong anti-androgen drug in it. When you come off those, there's a temporary, it could be for a few years though, there's a temporary surge in androgens, which can cause terrible post-pill acne and even measurably high androgens on blood tests. And that can take several years to kind of settle down, but that's, that's temporary. So I think that's important too. Like just because you've been told you have PCOS and you actually meet the criteria for PCOS doesn't mean you always will. A lot of women outgrow it. Some women, it's only temporary post pill. Some women, it's longer term and stretches all the way past menopause. So it, it varies. So number, so we have insulin resistant PCOS, post pill PCOS, it, what I called inflammatory PCOS, which is really more about gut health and kind of like the gluten dairy type of inflammation that some women are sensitive to. Not, not everyone has to avoid gluten and dairy by all means. I really don't want to suggest that. But if there's someone who has those, that kind of immune dysfunction or immune inflammation, then addressing that can have a beneficial anti-androgen effect. I guess that's what I'd say. You know, it actually helps to you know, reduce the inflammation that seems to reduce, I suspect, the androgen sens sensitivity of the androgen receptors. And then the fourth type is adrenal PCOS. It's actually completely different than the other types. It's quite related to, it's quite similar to adrenal hyperplasia, which I mentioned earlier, which is actually, it's not 
a problem. It's not that the ovaries are overproducing androgens. It's that the adrenal glands are producing quite high levels of DHEA and other androgens. So that requires, I mean, I guess in my book, I talk about licorice and some of the ways, some of the, you know, supporting the stress response system can help with that, which again, is not to suggest that stress is the cause. Like I'm just, obviously I'm just trying to be clear, like, you know, you can have on the one hand, the changes you need to make to try to make a difference, but that doesn't mean that you brought it on yourself. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So my question could come just asking you, could you reverse PCOS? Is that something that you could do or not? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You can reverse out of the symptom picture. You may always have an underlying tendency to excess androgens, or you might outgrow that. But yes, I mean, if you no longer, for example, if your periods are regular, your ovulation is regular, and the androgen symptoms have reduced to you know, a manageable or an unconcerning level, then it's essentially no longer qualifies for a PCOS diagnosis. But just to say that doesn't mean, I mean, it could, it could come back. So, you know, if, often if there's been a genetic vulnerability, that'll always be there. Yeah. Okay. So you could say PCOS at as a diagnosis, perhaps it's not necessarily reversible, but you can reverse all the symptoms that are associated with it. Yeah, and to be true, the diagnosis is just based on symptoms. It's one of those diagnoses where it's not actually identifying or seeing an underlying disease process. PCOS is by definition, it's like androgen excess symptoms and anovulation or irregular period symptoms. And if you don't have those symptoms anymore, then you by definition don't have PCOS anymore okay right okay yeah yeah awesome. okay let me ask you a few underrated overrated when it comes to supplements so i uh, or like treatments would you say that myo inositol is overrated or underrated to use it with pcos i'd say it's it's not overrated if anything it's underrated it's pretty great yeah i mean i would say it's pretty great and i don't know if you know but inositol made it into the evidence, the 2018 evidence-based guidelines for PCOS. So it's right there with a couple of things that shouldn't be there. It's there with the, why the pill is there, I don't know. <laughs> but like, you know, inositol is sitting right there as a, a mainstream recommendation. So I, I, I'm a pretty big fan. Yeah, I prescribe it a lot. And I guess I always feel like I'm doing an infomercial for it, but like, it's safe, it's not expensive, it's, you know, almost any brand is fine, I would say. So it's, but you need to take it. If you're going to do it, it has to be, commit to it for six months. So there's probably no point in doing it. Yeah. Let me ask you a follow-up question on that one. What is this, what's that special on myoinositol that makes it really, really great? Like if we compare it to other supplements, why that one is particularly, particularly beneficial and effective to treat PCOS? Well, it's just getting really good results in the clinical trials. Mechanism is that it amplifies the intracellular signals of FSH and insulin. So, you know, if the question is why is it outperforming other supplements, I'm not sure. I mean, partly because not, I mean, not a lot of supplements have been tested clinically trialed for PCOS, but it's, it's doing well. I mean, it's definitely, I think, should be on the radar of anyone with a true PCOS diagnosis, yes. Okay. Um, can yeah. you find inositol in foods or it has to be supplemented? Well, we make it as well. So there is some in food and we make it. I think to get the results, the therapeutic results, you really need, because you're supplementing at higher than normal levels. Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think you could. There's no way to kind of boost that with foods significantly. No, no. Okay. The second question is metformin. Is that overrated or underrated? I guess, I don't know. I guess probably about, again, similar. Like it, it's, it's maybe slightly overrated. It can be helpful. There's no question it can be helpful to improve insulin sensitivity, to improve insulin resistance. I guess my perspective is that with my own patients, like metformin can work. 
but it ca can cause digestive problems and it can cause B12 deficiency. So you need to keep an eye on that. And my perspective is other, that natural treatments work as well. I would say magnesium training would blow metformin out of the water, right? Like in terms of results, right? Like, so for my patients, I'm like, you could take metformin, but why? Like, why when you've got all these other things that you could do that are going to work better? That's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I completely agree with you in that one. Yeah. And then my, la my last question is about acne and menstrual cycle. So why is it normal to see acne around the luteal phase? What seems to be the cause? Is this preventable? Is it fixable? What is happening with this presence of acne? Not necessarily related with PCOS, but just yes. in more the more general uh, approach on like women in general will some women will experience acne what what yes. could be happening there yeah okay so from a from, i would say it's almost never in the, apart from pcos like when there's androgen excess that's definitely a hormonal cause but for women who are just getting a few premenstrual breakouts there's a it's a hormonal aggravation of an underlying problem usually gut or zinc deficiency or something like like usually dairy or you know gut problems so often i guess i would say even if there's a hormonal pattern like a premenstrual pattern to the skin the treatment is still to you know treat not necessarily treat the hormones but treat the skin so that it doesn't aggravate premenstrually but in terms of why it aggravates premenstrual premenstrually i think it's a combination of we all get a little androgen surge with ovulation. That's pretty normal, actually. Just get a little bump up in androgens. I think if your skin is sensitive to that, that'll shine through. I think the other thing at the end of the premenstrual cycle, what happens is estrogen and progesterone decline. I mean, that's normal. They're in free fall at that point. And that can worsen skin because both estrogen and progesterone are very good for skin. They both have a natural anti androgen, kind of anti acne effects so when they drop away i think that's part of the issue just to clarify progesterone is good for skin generally that doesn't mean progestins are a lot of, i just have to really have to say again a lot of types of hormonal birth control a lot of progestins that are used in hormonal birth control have a pro acne effect because they're quite similar to testosterone okay yeah i yeah. actually I actually looking forward to ask you one more question and then yes. if you have some time we could jump on some contraceptive question because I've I've seen quite a few repeating in the comments. Okay. Uh, so with what do you think what is your stance on seeing migraines and headaches around ovulation and PMS? What could be happening there that this is something that you might experience? A lot of it's to do with the histamine once at those times. So I'll just say, I'm just holding up my knee. For migraines, especially anyone who's 35 or older, if you're getting an increased frequency of migraines, there's a big section about migraines in my new book. So I'd refer you there because there's all different parts to migraine treatment and it's a little bit of troubleshooting to see which are the main aspects. But I would say the correlation especially like ovulation migraines around ovulation that's usually histamine flaring up at that time yeah okay all right let's move to contraceptives because yeah. there's quite a few questions on that one okay. so just kind of an introductory point to contraceptives would be what are some of the different type of contraceptive that you see you see a lot to to be used often by women and which of those might have the worst effects when it comes to water retention, sort of appetite, or even like looking at cravings and weight gain? Okay, well, hands down, the hormonal birth control that causes the most dramatic, that can cause the most dramatic weight gain is the Depo-Provera injection. And again, that's not progesterone, that's a drug called medroxyprogesterone. It, yeah, and I guess in terms of, I mean, I don't really necessarily want to, spend time like differentiating all the different types of hormonal birth control like obviously my work is about potentially finding non-hormonal birth control options so i might just kind of speak to that so if you can you know find a way to get onto a non-hormonal type of birth control then of course you're not going to have fluid retention or weight gain or any of those things because your hormones are going to be normal. So I'll just list what they are at the moment, what's available for non-hormonal. 
the copper IED, condoms, of which I'm a huge fan of condoms. I really, I'm just, depending on who's listening today, I've spoken to a lot of young people who seem to have been given the message that condoms don't work. And I really don't know where that came from. Like condoms are a method of avoiding pregnancy. There is always the option to use condoms, get one that fits, one that you know fits properly, is a good quality one, doesn't have spermicide because that's just going to cause UTIs. And then if there happens to be a condom failure, which is unlikely, you know, uncommon, but if that happens, for what it's worth, I think at that stage, the morning after pill is actually still preferable. It's basically just the pill. It's like a, you know, kind of one dose, bigger dose pill. That's still, in my thinking, that's better than taking the same drug daily, right? <laughs> like I sort of, I'm just putting that out there. So the condoms, there's a couple of new cervical cap diaphragms, which are another barrier method. And there's fertility awareness method based methods of avoiding pregnancy of which maybe you've done a podcast with someone about that. I mean, you could refer in the show notes to that. That's a whole, that's based on the, the principle that we're, as women, we're only fertile six days per cycle. Men are fertile every day. As women, we're fertile only six days. And you can figure that out, but you do have to either invest in an approved algorithm that can do that, usually with temperature. Learn how to temperature track yourself. You can't just take a random, any old period tracking app and rely on the ovulation window on that. You have to know what you're doing. But that's a, yeah, that's becoming that's a more and more popular way of avoiding pregnancy. And of course, then there's all the ways of avoiding pregnancy, which I hope are still going to be invented and brought to market. Because why, my, one of my messages is, why should women have to shut down their entire hormonal system and go into chemical menopause just to avoid pregnancy. Like <laughs> there has to be other ways. So. Better way. Yeah. Yeah. So do just very briefly, do you you mentioned that the Poprovera would be one of the hormonal therapies that are the, kind of the worst in terms of like side effects. So I'll I'll come into why are some contraceptives perhaps higher in progesterone and some others in estrogen? Is there a why? this is happening that the, there is one or the other is higher or perhaps the ratio of between these two is different is there a reason to to define why this is happening okay first of all there's no progesterone in any type of hormonal birth control and there's pretty much no natural estrogen in most types of hormonal birth control there are a couple on the market that use a body identical estradiol which is real estrogen but there's no hormones in hormonal birth control so for example like if you on a normal pill if you were to measure your blood levels of of estrogen and progesterone you have none because your own ovaries are shut down so they're not making any and you're not taking any because they're not actual hormones so an answer to your question why are some progestin only versus with some estrogen it, it just depends on Generally, progestin alone is not great for mood. In fact, when they invented the birth control, like, you know, 60, 70 years ago, they started with progestin only, never progesterone, but like a synthetic progestin. And the mood side effects were so horrendous that they put estrogen in there to, synthetic estrogen to try to kind of alleviate that. The problem is taking oral estrogen is, you know, risk for migraines. It's a risk for blood clot. You know, it's, taking synthetic estrogen orally is risky for some women. So then potentially those would be the women who have to take a progestin only method, either a mini pill or, and then in terms of the different amounts of progestin and synthetic estrogen and like which phases you, it's really just about managing breakthrough bleeding, basically trying to stop women from, it depends. I mean, some women need more drug than others to not get breakthrough bleeding. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I'll ask you one more question then. What are some potential situations when you would consider taking hormonal birth control? I mean, obviously there's going to be, there are some situations, yes. So, I mean, just very broadly, I guess the least harmful of all, in my view, the, the hormonal IUD is probably, because it allows natural menstrual cycle, it doesn't shut down ovulation usually, although it can. In my thinking, for that reason, it's better. So, Potentially that, certainly maybe some women who just are, whatever their situation is, they 
to avoid pregnancy, if, if the copper IUD or fertility awareness based methods or condoms are not an option, then of course they're gonna need something. So I'll acknowledge that. For very heavy bleeding, particularly during perimenopause or maybe associated with a condition called adenomyosis, the hormonal IUD can be a lifesaver because it reduces bleeding by 90%. So yeah, I've had patients where their bleeding was so terrible that I'm like, yes, like in your case, the hormonal ID is right, is correct. And just for what it's worth, especially for, I don't know if anyone is in that age group, 40 something is listening, but you can, because in my new perimenopause book, I talk a lot about using real progesterone for alleviating symptoms, mood and migraines and things like that. You can actually, you can take, you can use the hormonal ID and plus take progesterone. So you, you can, you know, combine the natural treatment with the contraceptive drugs yeah <laughs> yeah awesome well I, I really appreciate you coming to 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 the today's episode i had so many questions that i could continue to ask you like we could do like a, a full episode of two hours and still would be <laughs> time to cover all the questions yeah. i could go through but i think we've covered a pretty a pretty decent amount of questions and pretty good topics um, if anyone is interested in going further and reading and going into depth into menopause or birth control, the, there's your books that pretty much contain all the information. So this is just a little snippet of yeah. all the information that you can find in the book. But just really wanted to say thank you and appreciate your time to come along and having this chat with me. And is there any further projects you're into this year on the next year? Not, I mean, at this stage, I'm going to be doing quite a bit of training of practitioners. Like I'll be offering some through different people and maybe through myself, some webinars for practitioners. So that might be an option. I continue to see patients and yeah, just try to get the information out there. I might write a few blogs. I've got quite a popular blog, which needs, yeah, I, I might have some time this year to update. So yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for yeah. having me, Astrid. It was, yeah, it was really nice to meet you oh nice to meet you too now very quick things if you can send me the paper that yes. you've mentioned send it send it me to via dm so i can put it in my stories with a swipe up link so oh, people can okay. access it and read yes, it. I'll do that. okay um, yes yep and i can also put it in the show notes when i publish and i will be uploading this video edit it and put it in my youtube channel so I'll put in the show notes, I can put some information on how to find your books yeah. and also the, um, the paper you've written so they can read that through as well. So if you can send me that information, I'll be very grateful to put that information there. And yeah, yeah that's, that's I, pretty much what I wanted to know. So I'll be sharing this video as well in the story. So if you want to use it as well, please. That's all you can we can do at the moment and then I'll share the YouTube video link as well. So you have that sounds, if you want to as well. Sounds good. Sounds great. Right. Thanks so much. And thanks everyone who came in live to listen and ask questions and yeah, I'll see you again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Bye.